Welcome to a read review of the One Ring Starter Set, a new RPG beginner box for the second uh, edition of the One Ring role playing game. Thank you very much to Free League Publishing for sending us a copy of this box set to check out. Well, the One Ring Starter Set was designed by Marco Maggi and Francesco Nipitello, with additional development by Michelle Garboggio. Features adventures by James Spawn, maps from Francesco Mitoli, and fantastic artwork from far too many people to list here. Now, this new starter set, which is for the second edition of the One Ring role-playing game, was published by Free League Publishing in late 2021 after a very successful Kickstarter. It's designed to be played by a group of two to six players, and that includes the lore master, the GM role in this game. Now, the included adventure in Shire Swordsbook should provide many, many hours of gameplay, with each session expected to last about two hours, but multiple sessions in this box. Now, this very full and heavy RPG box set has a surprisingly odd MSRP of 4340 US. That is when buying direct for Free League. Though I gotta say, prices on online stores right now are all over the place. But the actual suggested price is forty three forty, and that's uh, due to the translation from Swedish kroners. Yes. Now, if you weren't one of the sixteen thousand plus backers on Kickstarter, <laughs> where it raised almost two million US, we'll help you decide if this is the game for you. Or if you did back it and put it on your role playing game shelf with all those other Kickstarters, we'll let you know if you should hurry to get that one to the table. Now, the One Ring Starter Set is a role-playing game beginner box. It's designed to introduce players to the second edition of the One Ring, which is, of course, a fantasy role-playing game set in Middle-earth. The world of J.R.R. Tolkien's Lord of the Rings, Hobbit, Silmarillion, and other works. It provides everything you need to play, including streamlined rules, ready-to-go characters, and an adventure that lets you take on the role of a group of hobbits experiencing their first taste of adventure. Note specifically for this box, hobbits. Not humans, elves, dwarves, or ants, just the hobbitses. Now, to take a look at all the components you get in this beginner box, what I suggest is you check out the One Ring Starter Set unboxing video that we have up on YouTube. Um, I had thought about holding up pictures you could see of these, but this is also going out an audio podcast, so the best way to see what you get is to check out that video. Now, since part of this review will highlight each of the components in detail. I'm not going to get into everything you get in the box here because we're going to talk about each of those. What I am going to say is that the component quality here is excellent. The books are well-bound soft cover books, the maps on thicker paper, almost cardstock level. The artwork here is amazing. Just what I want from a Lord of the Rings game. Uh, the Everything is, is excellent here. The writing is well done. I didn't see any grammar errors. Heck, they even use the inside of the box. Like the, the inside, like not, not the stuff in the box, but like the, the covers and the back cover to squeeze in even more content than would fit normally. So let's take a look at each of the things you get in this Middle Earth role playing game starter box. All right. I didn't expect to want to do this, but this is the first time I think I've ever had to do this. I want to talk about the box. So first off, it's sturdy. It's nice and sturdy, uh, which most sets nowadays are, but I am so glad we are past the days of thin card boxes that honestly don't even last a week on your shelf. Now, it's not the main thing I want to call out there. What I want to highlight is what I just mentioned, the inside of the box. The bo bottom has a map of the Shire with its four farthings and the, the areas around the Shire. And the box top has a rule summary as well as various tables you may need to reference during play. These together can be put up as basically a lore master screen when playing. And I've got to say, it's the first time I've ever seen this, and I think it's brilliant. So this was actually one of the last stretch goals for the Kickstarter okay. was to get this work placed inside the box specifically to be able to use this box as a kind of uh, makeshift DM screen. I, that is great. Like, I want to see more games do this. Uh, spoiler, I know one other that did. <laughs> um, so next, I want to bring up the, the one problem I found with this set, and that is the one ring starter set dice. These are proprietary custom dice consisting of two 12-sided dice and six six-sided dice. Now, the D6s at first glance look like normal D6s. They have the numbers one to six, but there are a couple special features. The first is that the six also contains this little T-looking symbol, which is the elvish numeral for one on it. 
These Elven ones are used to determine the degree of success when rolling. Now, the second unique feature on these dice are that numbers one to three are hollow and numbers four to six are solid. This is a reminder that comes up when your character is weary in the game. If you are tired, the one to threes don't count. Now, the D12 dice should contain the numbers one to 10, as well as Gandalf's rune on one side and the Eye of Sauron on the other. Now, I say should because, unfortunately, the physical dice actually have the numbers 2 to 11 on them. Now, this is a printing error and something Free League is well aware of and is working on getting fixed. If you do pick up this set and have misprinted dice, Free League will replace them for you if you wish. No, right now, they're just refixing it for the Kickstarter backers, but they will be moving on to everyone else. Now, personally, while I am disappointed by this error, I'm not sure it's worth forcing the company to accrue the cost of replacing these. You can just as easily read the 11 as a 1-1 one -one playing, or just let the 11 count as 11, because what Hobbit isn't excited about 11s is. Plus, at least for this starter set, this is a game about hope and exploration. And I don't think adding a slightly better chance of success is really a bad thing for the game. Indeed. Well, I'm sure for Free League, this is a huge deal. It's going to be a major black eye for them internally, given the popularity of the Kickstarter and how many sets of these dice went out. Mm -hmm. However, it's also in the grand scheme of things, a staggeringly minor issue. Now, the One Rank Starter Set comes with a beautiful, large, two-sided, eight-panel. I don't know if you call it eight-fold or eight-panel. When it's pulled out, you got eight-panel maps. On one side, it has the Shire, as you'd expect. Now, the other side shows the region of Middle-earth called Iriador. Now, I never picked up the original version of the One Ring RPG. This is my first experience with it, but I learned from Pookie UK, uh, who's a very prolific RPG reviewer. Look them up. Uh, they do reviews from Relay that there's a change in setting here from the previous edition of this RPG. So this map and this area has never been explored in the One Ring role-playing game before. Now, the original game was set in Rovanion, which is a region east of the Misty Mountains. Now, well, I think the Shire map is awesome and it looks great and you're going to want to use it while playing the included adventure um, in interesting ways, is all I'll say. The map at Iriador is more useful for people who just want a cool piece of Lord of the Ring things and kind of see what the Shire is. It's not needed for anything in this box, but what it can be awesome for is for any group that moves on to the full game, because this is the core area of Middle Earth that this particular version of the One Ring will be exploring. Now, this map of Eridor could be a confusing adder, since, again, as we just said, it's not really useful in the starter box, but you don't get it without buying the starter box. Mm -hmm. So it's nice that they didn't waste the backside of the Shire map. And this actually is the first of many things you'll see that they did include in this box to make it useful for people playing the full game, which the next item in particular comes up are the item and stance cards. Now, first I wanna talk about the item cards. You get 30 of these, these feature artwork and the item name on one side and a description of the item and stats on the other. And I know there's enough gamers out there that hate cards in the role-playing games. Personally, I love them. I love getting cards because it saves you having to look up stuff in the book while playing. And I've got to say, I also love the fact when you get item cards like this, you can actually have players build a tableau in front of them of what they have equipped at the time. And you know what's stowed and what's not. That's just something it's just easier to keep track of that way. You know, another valuable reason to get this particular set, as currently none of these card decks are available for sale separately. For now, we don't know if they're going to add them or not later. Next are the stance cards. These are bigger square cards, and these are specifically included, as it says in the book, for people who go on to play the core rulebook. Now, there is some simple rules for using the stance side of these cards, and it's really basic, but it doesn't even mention what the other side is for. And then looking at it and reading them, they seem to be about exploration and long distance travel, which anyone who's a fan of Tolkien's work knows that's going to be part of the game. Now, personally, I don't mind these. Like, really, they're a tease of something more. And I got to say, they seem like I'm going to want them if I do switch to the full rules. Now, unlike some of their other product lines, at least as we are recording this, they are really trying to push the bundle of mm -hmm. Starter Box and Core Book as the dice are currently the only component available separately from the Starter Box. And I will fully admit, full disclosure, I did get that bundle. That is, this is the only part of it I've touched so far, but I did get that bundle. Now, the starter set includes six hobbits for you to play. 
Uh, for those who care, that you have Roramac Brandy Book, Primula Brandy Book, Paladin Took the Second, Lobelia Brace Girdle, Esmeralda Took, and Drogo Baggins. Now, Middle Earth fans are probably going to recognize some of those names as relations to some more famous hobbits. In fact, it would be hard to think of anyone considering this purchase ga- purchasing this game not being somewhat familiar with the Tooks and the Brandywines, at least. Now, each character she has a beautiful image of the character, a detailed description that actually includes some role-playing cues, as well as ties to the other characters, which is always good to see in a game like this. The other side, of course, has the game information, your stats, skills, etc. Note one thing that you will not find in this box. There are any rules for character creation or character advancement. That is something that is not covered by this at all. The included adventures are designed specifically around these characters. And the number of characters included was another one of the stretch goals. Oh. Uh, the original plan was only to have three, which wow. seems a little odd as four players, uh, including the GM, including the lore master, uh, seems a bit low, even for a starter box. Uh, I gotta say that that slightly concerns me because I plan to run the game with five players. <laughs> that might be more than this was attended. Now, in addition to the six hobbits, there are two other character sheets. Um, these are literally unlocked while playing the adventure. That is something else I have never seen in a role-playing starter set before. And I dig it. I love the, the, the fact that as you play, you can unlock more playable characters. Uh, the very video game-like, but hey. Um, as for what these characters are, uh, you're going to have to play the game to find out. Though if you want a spoiler, watch our unboxing. Unlockable content in your RPG, I like. Far mm-hmm. better than loot boxes, that's for sure. Yeah, the, the item deck is randomized when you get Yonona. None of that's going on. <laughs> All right, here's what I know a lot of people are curious about the rules. The rules are presented in a book called The Rules, uh, which is only 24 pages long. You get the usual prologue, an example of play, which introduces the setting, which is specifically Middle Earth in the Shire around the year 2960, which is the Twilight of the Third Age, a period set between the events of The Hobbit and Lord of the Rings. Bilbo's back with his treasure, but the Fellowship hasn't been formed yet. Now, the system in the One Ring involves a dice pool. This dice pool will always contain at least one of the D12 dice called Feet Dice. You're also going to add a number of D6 success dice based on what skill the character is using. You total these dice, you roll them all together, and compare the results to a target number which is actually derived from the character's attributes of strength, heart, or wits, depending on what you're trying to do. Now, I got to say, this is quite different from most other popular role-playing games, especially fantasy ones, where the game master would be the one that sets the target number instead of it being a number determined by your attributes. Now, with the feet die, the Gandalf rune symbol represents an automatic success, so you always have a 1 in 12 chance to succeed. And the Ion Sauron, while not a automatic fail, does count as a zero. Now, the elven rune on the D6, remember there's an elven one on the six side of the D6s, determines the degree of success on a successful roll, with one rune meaning a great success and two or more meaning an extraordinary success. Now, again, these are the simplified beginner box rules. There may be more variety to these dice in the full game. And again, even with the misprint on the feet die, your actual mathematical advantage gained is very minuscule. Uh, again, you've got an 8.3% chance of rolling any specific uh, face on the D12, mm-hmm. uh, or you you can add it. It's an overall shift of one higher if you if you count it as 2 to 11 instead of 1 to 10, which is really only going to bump your totals up a maximum of 5% on your, on, on your total chance of success, which is very minimal. And again, it's a game of hope. Very true. As expected, there are also systems for modifying the difficulty based on what's going on in the story. These include adding and removing success dice, as well as having a system for rolling two feet dice and keeping the highest or the lowest dive due to favorable or unfavorable situations in the game. Now, fitting with the theme, there is also a uh, resource management kind of system of hope and inspiration, which allows players to add additional dice to their pool and has ways to both gain or lose both hope and inspiration while playing. 
Now, characters take damage or overburden themselves. They become weary. And that's where that one to three result on the success dice comes in where they don't count for your roll. Just goes to show there are seven meals in a day and skipping one can leave you out of sorts and weary. Now, the various player hero characteristics include the three attributes I've already mentioned, strength, heart, and wits. There's also distinctive features which can be called on for inspiration, both in role-playing and mechanically with the inspiration mechanic. Uh, skills here, though, are very Middle Earth based and quite different from what you see in other fantasy role playing games. You're going to find skills like courtesy and hearten, explore, riddle, song and travel, along with more typical skills like athletic scan and stealth. And of course, there are also combat skills, which are actually broken up into axes, bows, spears and swords. And every player has a derived parry value. That is actually the target number that the opponents are rolling to hit in combat. So combat but not just yes. combat. Yeah, actually, combat is probably the least focused part of this game. Now, combat is here, and it is very abstract. You're not going to see any maps and minis and measuring distances here, and possibly maybe more abstract than some players like. I'm not sure on that, though. Because combat starts with one or more opening volleys, where combatants with ranged weapons can fire on either side. Then you shift to close quarter rounds once your groups have met each other. Now, in these, players individually will decide, are you going to fight in close combat or ranged combat? But you can't pick ranged combat unless at least two characters are fighting in close combat. Now, each close combatant is going to pick one enemy out of the group that's there to fight with. If there are more close combatant characters than enemies, you're going to pair up. So two of you will go against one enemy. If there are more enemies than characters, the lore master gets to decide what to do with the overflow, either having them pair up or they can have the baddies stay back in ranged combat or pair up against a single character. Now, attack rolls use the same system outlined above where you're trying to beat your strength target number and you're rolling under your appropriate weapon. And again, the bad guys are trying to roll your parry target number. Now, success symbols rolled on the success die. Those are those elven runes let you trigger special effects. Um, in this particular version of the game, and I assume there's more in the other, your options are do a heavy blow, do a piercing attack, or fend off the enemy. The ranged melee interaction, is, uh, or ranged versus melee interaction, is interesting, and I would love yeah. to see that play out, because it feels like it has some real party balance benefits. It sounds like there's going to be some interesting tactical options on both sides for who engages what. Yeah, like I said, it's definitely out there. You're not measuring anything. You're not like who's exactly where. It's just, you know what? Bilbo's going to try to take out that warg and Frodo or Sam's going to try to keep the, the, the ring wraith at bay. And in the meantime, Peregrine's in the back with his boat. Yep. Now, damage in this system causes endurance loss. You're, you you got to have a hit point system in a fantasy role playing game. I guess it, you just can't get rid of it. Um, once you lose endurance, you are going to become wary Eventually, if you hit your carrying load, so the amount you're carrying is affected by this, and eventually if you lose all your endurance, you're just knocked unconscious. Enemies are defeated when reduced to zero endurance, just to keep things simple, not the only game that's done this. Now, I mentioned one of the special effects are piercing blows. Those have the possibility of causing a wound, which can be prevented with armor, and there's a little die roll system based on what armor you're wearing. I'm not going to get into the details of that. Now, enemies are defeated after taking one room wound you wound it it's done doesn't matter how many endurance it has left that's important to note kind of like critical hits and other systems we like whereas characters can survive their first wound fine with some ongoing penalties but risk severe consequences if they take a second wound potentially causing the character to have to give up adventuring note one of those consequences that is not on the table is character death that is not something that is possible in this game a very modern and welcome take on combat outcomes to be sure. Now the adventure book is the second largest book in the starter set, clocking in at 31 pages. You are not looking at one short one-shot adventure here. You are looking at a full story arc called the, the Conspiracy of the Red Book, which is designed specifically for the hobbits included in this box set. Now this book is meant to be used at the same time as the Shire book, which also comes in the set and I'll talk about in a minute, uh, to tell a five adventure story me to tell a five adventure story that begins with the player heroes meeting up with a rather eccentric hobbit known as Bilbo Baggins. Now these adventures are detailed enough that while each one could potentially be played through in a single session, there's enough meat there, especially when combined with the Shire book, 
that a lore master could easily stretch them out and turn the entire thing into a much longer campaign. Yeah, you know, it's really nice to see that option out there for the lore master to choose from when it comes to adjusting game length. Now, overall adventure here is lighthearted and family friendly. You are hobbits doing things in the Shire and doing things while hobbits might consider quite dangerous really don't compare to your usual fantasy starter adventure. You're not going to find any monster bashing dungeon crawls here, but rather exciting adventures for any hobbit with a little bit of tooth in their blood. As we all know, hobbitses aren't the most adventuring sort by nature. It would be quite unlike them to be fighting about something that didn't involve having to miss a meal. Now, the final thing you get is that uh, Shire book I mentioned. This is the biggest book of the bunch, and I've got to say, this surprises me. This seems like a standalone product on its own. It is a soft cover book at a meaty 52 pages. This lets you know pretty much everything you want to know about the Shire and the history of the Shire and Hobbits. In addition to providing history, geography, you also get a ton of potential story prompts and inserted game rules, I guess we'll call them. Um, you're going to find a table and rules for Hobbit walks. Because trust me, it's Lord of the Rings. You're going to be walking. There's multiple in gossip tables. There is even a table in case the characters happen to ask about what Gandalf's been up to. You're going to have encounter tables and then details of landmarks and Hobbit families and the Matham House and Hobbiton and the, the, the cornerstone that marks the four farthings and so on. There is plenty going on in the Shire as presented in this book, enough to fuel many adventures, both during and potentially after you're done playing the adventure book. That is a lot of stuff. Yeah. So now that we know what you get in this RPG beginner box, what are your overall thoughts about the game? So I, I'm impressed. Like, I, I am very impressed with the One Ring starter set. This is honestly one of the most impressive RPG box sets I've ever had the pleasure of checking out. And I have checked out a lot of starter sets over the years. As any regular listener will know, you do have a love of starter boxes. Yes, I do. Now, physically, this is a beautiful Middle Earth product. Everything is designed in an appealing and easy to use way. There's artwork aplenty and the layout and graphic design flow and work really well. The editing appears to be great, though I would really like it if the books had an index um, or just like one index for the full set. Other than that, I didn't really notice any issues during my read through and later rereading before I published this review. Uh, the only problem with production I found, honestly, is the printing error on the D12, which I already mentioned. I don't think we need to get into again. Sadly, the inclusion of an index in these in RPG products has been more and more something of an extra rather mm -hmm. than a basic expectation in a book. Now, I suspect for Free League in particular, the primary reason is that with any purchase of the one ring any of the different one ring core set starter box etc they give you full pdf copies and you can always just control f true enough still would have liked an index to me that's a to me that's a must have that, that that's a bigger issue to me than the d12 being wrong though i'll see just how bad it is referencing a dream play now Middle Earth's big, right? Like, like the lore of Middle Earth, the world Tolkien created in the languages is long and broad, and that really shows in this product, especially in the Shire booklet. Now, I'm a fan of Tolkien's work. I've read the most of the primary works, but I'm no uber fan. I've got to admit that reading through the Shire booklet took me a long time. Uh, it gets quite dry at times and honestly did remind me of reading some of Tolkien's books, including knowing what type of flowers are growing on the bush by the side of the road. Um, I got to say, though, big time Lord of the Rings fans will probably eat this up and devour this book and love it. I will say it did seem to be a bit much. I will admit when I run the game, I will probably be a little more vague and reference this book for general themes and feel rather than specific steps or locations of certain rocks. Yeah, there are some seriously deep facts here. Tolkien fans will not be disappointed. I think it's pretty fair to say that this is a Cimmerillion level depth on the Shire in on the Shire. specifically. Yeah, I can totally see that. Though I am sure there's still more out there that isn't in the book as well. Now, as for the system, 
I, it sounds very solid. Um, I really like the fact that you have that feet die. That is a neat thing. It reminds me of the control die in the classic sci-fi role-playing game Alternity from TSR. Yeah, I know, deep cut here. But I always liked it because that game, you always roll a D20 and then another die based on your stat. And I love the fact that it was they were using the scientific method of a control die. You always have a 1 to 20 chance modified by your skill. I, I thought that was fantastic. And I like that it's in this. It, it fits. And I actually even more like that it's a D12 because you don't have quite the, the linear curve as you did. Well, technically, it's a D10. Um, I also like that they have, um, most people are going to know it as the D&D inspiration system where favorable conditions, you roll two fate dice and take the highest. Unfavorable, you take two feet dice and roll the less. I have enjoyed this particular mechanic in every RPG I played or run that uses it, and there are multiples out there. Uh, the endurance and mood system seems very suited to this particular setting, um, and so does the, the resource of hope, which can be gained, lost, or spent, and inspiration. And like reading through the module, there's really interesting things where like when things aren't going well, all your characters start losing hope. And to me, that is a something that ties it to the, the source material really well. So you know, really, you're getting a solid system with some known features used mm -hmm. in reasonable ways to play out your adventures with. Now, one note I don't know anything about is one of the things I do like as a dungeon master. And one of the reasons I prefer D100 based systems is I like knowing the odds. I have no clue what the odds are in this game whatsoever of doing anything. D12 plus possibly another D12 and a number of D6s added together to be the target number. I, I, as a DM, I do like to know the odds, but you know what? I don't know if it's going to matter because one of the most unique things in this system is the target number system. I am so used to the DM having to assign a difficulty to everything you do. In your D100 system, are you rolling this stat? Well, you're getting plus 10 or minus 10, whatever. It's going to take me a while to get used to just going, roll the thing, and the player being able to tell me if they succeed or fail instead of having the player have to tell me what they rolled and me tell you if they failed or not. This system, though, does seem like it's going to reduce latency. Yeah, no, not having to request a target number and wait for the GM to work it out is certainly a nice feature for any game. Uh, yep. I, I, the last the last uh, superhero system I played prior to masks, I had to come up with VCs and I, I no, I don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> now, the one thing that totally surprised me about this box set and I just did not expect is the amount of useful material for players who don't plan on ever playing the starter set, for people who just want to dive into the full one ring experience with the nice hardcover rule book. In addition to this being like a great gateway to the one ring, I honestly think this is also like it's two products at once. It's also the Shire expansion for the one ring. Overall, the one ring starter set is a fantastic RPG beginner box. As someone checking out the one ring for the first time, this honestly contains everything I think I would want in a starter set to get, ex let me experience the world for the first time, including a whole lot more I would have never thought I wanted. If you and your group are at all curious about the One Ring Second Edition, this is the obvious place to start. In this box, you get everything you need to play, including simplified rules, pre-generated characters, a starting adventure that's so detailed, it could be the basis of an entire campaign, Maps, reference cards, and more. Uh, yeah, it's very clear that the best choice for people who are trying to really delve deeply into this setting in an RPG and who didn't go in on the Kickstarter is to buy the bundle, the core mm -hmm. rules, and the starter set. You're definitely going to get the most bang for your buck. Now, if you're a fantasy role-playing game fan looking for a different take on fantasy role-playing, one about discovery, whimsy, interaction, and exploration, with less focus on simulation or combat, I think you're going to find a lot to like in this box set. This is definitely not your typical dungeon-crawling role-playing game, which honestly fits a game set in Middle-earth and based on Tolkien's work. Now, for those of you who aren't a fan of Tolkien, I, you probably want to avoid this one. The game is pretty much dripping with Tolkien lore and is fully steeped in the themes and settings of his books. If you haven't read The Cimmerillion, or at least tried willing, intentionally to read The Cimmerillion <laughs> for fun, probably not. 
Now, hack and slash, kill the monsters, get their stuff so I can kill bigger monsters and badder monsters and get even bigger and better stuff to kill more. You are probably not going to like this game. This is probably not for you. Well, it's possible the full one ring rules may support the style of play. You're not going to find that in this box set. Yeah, murder hobos aren't part of the Hobbiton world. Murder hobbits may be in the full one, but definitely not in this box set. Now, the one group, again, I was surprised that may be interested in this box are the people who already picked up the One Ring, who already play it, or people who went and picked up the full game and are planning on playing it. Because in addition to being a gateway to the game, this works as a Shire expansion. I, this is a Shire setting in a box. If you plan on including the Shire in any of your One Ring games, this set's going to be worth picking up, even if you never use it as a beginner box or use the NPCs or play the adventure. Plus, you're going to get that extra stuff like the cards and the map that you don't get anywhere else. Yeah, the um, as I said before, unless they start releasing pieces separately if, at, at, at a certain point, the starter box is really the only way to get a lot of this content now that the Kickstarter is over. An interesting choice. I just think they expect everyone to start with it, so which is probably fair. Now, as for me, my next step is going to be sitting down and actually playing through the adventures. Now, I do have the full core rulebook, but I'm not even going to touch it. I don't want it to blend into my games of playing the starter set. So that's going to go on the shelf for now. And I'm going to sit down and I'm going to run the Run Ring starter set with my friends and family. It's something I hope to start in the next month or so. And when that starts, I'll be sure to be talking about it here on our podcast and on social media streams. Until then, remember, not all those who wander are lost. Well, that's it for our review of the One Ring starter set. What's your favorite RPG beginner box? Let us know in the comments below. Now, for a more detailed look at this box set, I invite you to check out my written review of the One Ring starter set over at tabletopbellhop.com, which I'll also include some more pictures of the components so you can see everything you get.